Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. An imperfect instrument of God. When J. Wilbur Chapman was in London, he had an opportunity to meet a gentleman by the name of General William Booth, who at the time was well past the age of 80. And so Dr. Chapman listened reverently as this old general spoke of the trials and the conflicts and even the victories that he had experienced. So these American evangelists, he asked the general, he said, would you please disclose to me your secret to success? So the general hesitated for a moment. And you can begin to see the tears well up in his eyes and then finally falling down his face. And he looked at the doctor, he said, I will tell you my secret. He said, here's the secret to my success. And it is simple. My secret is simply that God has had all there was of me. He said, there have been men with greater brains than I. Men with greater opportunities. But from the day that I got the poor of London on my heart, and a vision of what Jesus Christ could do with the poor of London, I made up my mind that God would have all of William Booth that there was. And if there is anything of power in the Salvation Army today, it is because God has all the adoration of my heart, all the power of my will, and all the influence of my life. After hearing that, Dr. Chapman said that he went away from that meeting with General Booth knowing that the greatness of a man's power is the measure of his surrender. Yeah. I chose this particular illustration with the hopes and the belief that it will resonate in your spirit the same way that it resonated in mine. Because sometimes when you have been chosen by God, uh, you will often compare yourself to others uh, by way of their gift and by way of their qualifications. And in doing so, we often find out that there are indeed others that may have greater brains than we have. We discover that there are others with bigger platforms than we have. And we discover that there are others that have more degrees than we have. And because of these discoveries, uh, many of us can sometimes feel as though we are not uh, the best choice to do what God has called us to do. However, when we allow the words and the truth of Dr. J. Wilbur Chapman's discovery, which is the greatness of a man's power is the measure of his surrender, uh, we will no longer view ourselves as lesser than. Okay, let me see if I can say it this way. Uh, when we realize that God choosing us is not about us, but it is in spite of us, because perfection is found in none of us, we will understand that imperfection describes all of us and not just some of us. I'm going to say it one more time. I know it's a tongue twister. But when we realize that God choosing us is not about us, but it is in spite of us because perfection is found in none of us, we will understand that imperfection describes all of us and not just some of us. In other words, when God decides or when God chooses to use someone, none of us should have this precipitous look of bewilderment and shock on our face as if to say that individual is not qualified to do what God has called them to do. I, I, I feel you, but, but before, before you start judging, before we start passing judgment, and before we start declaring who qualifies and who doesn't qualify, perhaps we should remember Isaiah chapter 64 verses 6 through 8, so that we will not become so arrogant and pompous. Here's what it says. It says, but we are all as unclean things, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away, and there is none that calleth upon thy name, uh, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy faith from us, uh, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, Thou art our father, and we are the clay, and thou art our potter. And we all are the work of thy hand. This passage of scripture helps us to remember that all of our righteousness is as filthy 
rags. It's a reminder that none of us are better qualified to be used by God uh, than our neighbor. So instead of being judgmental and jealous of those who have been chosen, we should be rejoicing in the fact that God still uses uh, imperfect instruments for his glory. In all reality, uh, if the truth be told, uh, it's not our titles or our positions or even our degrees uh, that qualify us, uh, but our qualification comes from God. Romans chapter number 8. Verses 29 through 30, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Listen to me, Bethel. Uh, this means that someone could be a drug addict today, but the next time you see them, they may have a call on their life to be a deacon. This means that someone uh, could have an ugly attitude this week, but next week they may have a call on their life to be an usher. This means that someone could have the most vulgar mouth uh, you have ever heard in your life, uh, but by the time God is done with them, uh, they may be called to lead uh, praise uh, and worship. Uh, see, the truth of the matter is all of us have a past. But God still chooses to use us. In other words, uh, we never know who God may use to be the next pastor. Uh, we never know who God will use to be the next deacon. Uh, we never know who God will use to be the next tr trustee. Uh, we don't know who will be the next evangelist, uh, the next praise and worship leader, the next usher, the next parking lot attendant, the next greeter, or the next Sunday school teacher. It may be someone uh, that was groomed in the church, or it may be someone who did not grow up uh, in the church. Uh, it could be someone who may have a deep relationship with God, uh, or it may be someone who has to be arrested it by God because God can use whomever he pleases and this is the lesson that we are taught here in our text in Acts chapter 9 we started reading in verse number 10 so allow me to catch you up on this prolific dissertation of Luke uh, there is a man by the name of Saul and Saul has been given permission to go to Damascus and to arrest any man or woman uh, that were followers of Christ. And as he is approaching Damascus, as he is making his journey to complete this evil mission of persecuting Christians, the Bible says that a light shined round about him from heaven and that he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then Saul asked this question. Who are you? I would be fine if it just stopped. And who are you? But there's another word at the end of that. He said, who are you, Lord? Watch this. Saul has been persecuting Christians and blaspheming the name of Christ. But now he refers to him as Lord. Now, when he refers to him as Lord, it's not by way of relationship, but it's by way of revelation. See, the question, who are you, is an implication of Saul's unacquaintedness with Christ. But he doesn't recognize his voice as his own sheep does. But at the same time, there is this desire to know Christ because of what has been revealed to him by way of the light and the voice that came from heaven. In other words, there are some people who will sit around here and blaspheme the Lord, talk about the Lord, and reject the Lord, but still know who he really is. And they won't ever admit to that until they get knocked off their beast. <laughs> Sometimes it's not until you get knocked off of your feet that you got to make an admission that, God, if you don't help me, I won't be helped. And so watch this now. Now, Saul moves from blaspheming Christ to inquiring about Christ. And the Lord responded to his question by saying, I am Jesus, the one who you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. When Saul gets up off the ground, the Bible says that he cannot see. So the men that was with him took him by the hand, and they led him to Damascus. 
And for three days, Saul was blind and did not eat or drink anything. And then finally, God tells Ananias, go to the house of Judas and ask for a man named Saul from Tarsus. He said, he is praying for me right now. Can I put a kickstand right here? Uh, see, a lot of times we pray for some things and we pray to God and we feel like God is not working. But Paul, Saul is in another place praying. And while he is praying, watch this, the Lord is working. He, he's moving on somebody else's heart to go do something because somebody else is over here praying. <laughs> that ought to be good news to somebody today. Huh? You've been praying about some situations in your life uh, and it seems as though God is not moving. But can I tell you that God is in the ear of one of his servants right now uh, sending an angel by uh, to answer your prayer. Uh, Paul is praying for me or Saul is praying for me right now. So Ananias, I need you to go. Ooh. He said, I need you to go. He says, I need you to lay hands on him because I've shown him in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. Ananias is fearful. And he began to remind God just who Saul was and what he had done. But God responded by saying, go. For Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings. That's pretty much the story. God shows us that he will choose even those that seem the least likely to be used by him because God specializes in using imperfect instruments for his glory. And I want you to know that God can also use you as an imperfect instrument for his glory. But when we look in this text and we look at the life of Saul, uh, it proves to us uh, that we, we must first surrender and come under the arrest just as Saul did. And when we surrender to God, we will discover that God can use us as imperfect instruments, number one, in spite of our past faults. I'm just going to go through the text. When we look at Saul, and the life that he is living, when he is called and arrested by God, it helps us to see that God reserves the right to use whomever he chooses, no matter how much of a checkered past they may have. The truth of the matter is that Saul was a very unlikely candidate for the service of the Lord. He was a man who, who was feared and strongly disliked by Christians. He, he was one who, who, who did any and everything in his power to destroy the name of the Lord. Watch this. And by his own testimony, was guilty of doing everything he could to put Christianity to death. Where's where this testimony at, Pastor? Uh, you have to go over into Acts chapter number 26. Uh, 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 it's going to say Paul, but we know that Saul becomes Paul. Look at his testimony in Acts 26, verses 9 through 11. It says this, I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus, the Nazarene. Indeed, I did just that in Jerusalem. Authorized by the leading priests, I caused many believers there to be sent to prison, and I cast my vote against them when they were condemned to death. Many times I had them punished in the synagogue to get them to curse Jesus. I was so violently opposed to them that I even chased them down in foreign cities. By Saul's own admission, we are able to see that he was a wicked man. He, he, he was a murderer. He, he, he was a rebel against the Lord. Watch this. Even when Saul wasn't committing murder, he was aiding and abetting. I'm still in the Bible. Look, look at what takes place when Stephen was stoned to death. Acts chapter number 7, verse 57 and 58. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. They rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Here it is. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul, we finna kill somebody. Hold this. I got you. Kill him. 
He's a wicked man. Even when he's not committed murder, he's aiding and he is abetting. It's always wicked as they come. But once he received Jesus in his heart, he was changed forever by the grace of God, and his past was no longer an issue. In the same way that Saul's past did not hinder him from being chosen and used by God, I want you to know that your past cannot hinder you uh, from being used by God either. Uh, it does not matter uh, what you may have done before you came to Christ. Uh, I want you to know uh, that it has been forgiven and it has been forgotten uh, because of Christ. Uh, the Bible says it this way in Psalm 103, uh, verses 8 through 12, the Lord is merciful and gracious, uh, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. Uh, he will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. Uh, he has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities for as the heaven is high above the earth so great is his mercy toward them to fear him as far as the east is from the west so far has he removed our transgression from us okay that didn't shout you here's another one in the book of Micah it's in there you don't go there often but it's in the bible Micah Chapter number 7, verses 18 through 19, it says, Where is another God like you who pardons the guilt of the remnant, overlooking the sins of his special people? You will not stay angry with your people forever because you delight in showing unfailing love. Once again, you will have compassion on us. You will trample our sins under your feet and throw them into the depths of the ocean. God has not only forgiven your sins, but he has forgotten your sins. He has thrown them into the sea of forgetfulness. Watch this. And because he has forgotten them and thrown them into the sea of forgetfulness, that means that there's only three records of your past. Bear with me one second. The record you keep in your own mind while you keep beating yourself up over and over again about what you did. But then there's the record that other people keep uh, who remember who you were uh, and what you done uh, and who you did it with uh, and want to remind everybody else. Uh, but then the third record is the record that Satan keeps uh, where he continuously try to accuse you uh, before God and try to tell God uh, that you're not worthy. But can I tell you something? It don't matter about your record that you keep of yourself. Uh, it don't matter about the record that other people keep of you. Uh, it don't matter about the record that Satan have uh, because when they bring it up to God. God gets a spiritual case of amnesia. It says, I don't remember because I've already thrown it into the sea of forgiveness, forgetfulness. It's good news to know that God in heaven has given you a clean slate and has chosen you as an instrument for his glory. That don't mean much to some of y'all because you've been good all your life. But some of us look back and say, what in the world was I thinking about? Some of us remember why in the world did I continuously go to that place? Some of us remember and all we can do is say, if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side. And we shout, watch this, because he kept us, uh, but we shout even more because he forgot about it. Woo! Real quick, real quick, real quick. It wasn't malicious, but a friend of mine reminded me <laughs> on Facebook of something I did back in the day. And he did it in such vivid details. So much so, oh, you read that? Here he go describing it. So much so that one of my other homeboys called me. And he said, man, listen, he ain't have to put you out there like that. And then he had the nerve to come behind it with, but thank God for where you are now. And for the way you give without wanting anything back in return. My friend called me and said, man, you might as well take the rest of that down. You know, throw them under the bus. Uh, because people will keep a record of what you did. 
But God says, I forgot all about it. And because I've forgotten, it makes you qualified. It makes you worthy to be used as an imperfect instrument of God for his glory. When we look at the life of Saul, it serves as proof that God can use us in a, as an imperfect instrument in spite of our past faults. But secondly, when we look at the life of Saul, it serves as proof that God can use us as imperfect instruments in spite of our present flaws. I know, Pastor, that's about the same thing, ain't it? Stay with me. Look at what it says in the text, verse 17 through 19. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says instantly something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. But here's what I want you to see. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. After Saul had been arrested by God on the road to Damascus, and after Ananias came to him and laid hands on him and baptized him, the Bible says that something like scales fell off of his eyes and he regained his sight. Saul was able to experience some things in the spirit that he had never experienced before. An experience that would change his life forever. But right after he was miraculously able to see and after he was baptized, after this spiritual encounter, the Bible says that he ate some food and regained his strength. Pastor, why are you so stuck on him eating? To some of you, it just looked like I'm being greedy. I just want to talk about food. <laughs> but when I read this, something leap off the page to me. After all of this wonderful spirituality that has taken place in Saul's life, the Bible says afterwards he ate some food. The reason that I wanted to point this out is so that we can understand that no matter how spiritual you may become, there will still be times in which our flesh will remind us that we're still human. It's spiritual. The scales fell off his eyes. He's been baptized. And then all of a sudden, in the midst of all this spirituality, his flesh lets him know, oh, you still got some weaknesses. Oh, you still hungry. You still need to be strengthened. It says he ate and he regained his strength. See, too many times uh, we were trying to act as if we have arrived uh, and that all of our mistakes uh, and our shortcomings are a thing of the past now because we have given our lives to Jesus. Uh, but just because God has forgiven us uh, and overlooked our past faults, uh, it does not mean that we don't have any present flaws. Oh, you ain't shouting so much now. Oh, you shouting about your, your past faults being forgiven. But don't nobody want to shout about your present flaws. And Ananias laid hands on Saul and baptized him, and Saul was filled with the Holy Spirit. And at that moment, Saul's heart was changed, but it does not mean that his flesh was tamed. Ooh, see, we don't want to talk about that. He, he has a change of heart, but he's still wrapped in his flesh. In other words, Saul has been saved, but there were still some things that Saul would struggle with in his flesh. Paul still had some problems, but the same way that the Lord chose to use him in spite of his faults, uh, he also chooses to use him in spite of his flaws. Uh, and I know that some of you may be wondering, uh, what is the difference uh, in having faults and having flaws? Uh, so let me take about 25 seconds to, to see if I can help you. Uh, you see, your faults and your flaws, they both point out the fact that we are imperfect. But your faults have to do with your choices you made, while your flaws are about how you were made. Woo. Okay, somebody still missed it. Okay, it didn't help you. Let me try this way. Your faults are about your decisions, but your flaws are about your design. Okay, this is the last one. It's the best I got. You don't get this one, ask your neighbor after church. 
Here it is. Your faults are the consequences of your dereliction of conduct, but your flaws are the results of your deficiencies in your character. Woo! See, when you look at Saul's faults, we see his intent. In his faults, he meant to be evil. In his faults, he meant to kill people. In his faults, he meant to threaten you. In his faults, he meant to persecute you. Those were his faults. But when you look at his flaws, his flaws were not intentional. That's why he said, the good that I would do. Woo! The very thing I said that I wouldn't do no more, I still find myself doing it. See, sometimes, watch this, because we are in this flesh, uh, we can mean well, and we can say what we're not going to do, uh, but sometimes temptation uh, overtakes you, uh, and you find yourself doing the same thing uh, you said that you wouldn't do. But in spite of his faults, and in spite of, in spite of his flaws, God still uses him. Ooh, watch this. He, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. After he was filled with the Holy Spirit, his flaws still remain evident, but not as a result of, a result of his sedition, but as a result of God being sovereign. I got to give you, I gotta give you some scripture because y'all looking at me crazy. And for the critics and skeptics that's watching, this is not a crutch to sin. This, well, y'all can take it too, but it really wasn't for y'all. See, I do have other preachers that follow me, and then they want to criticize me. Down there just telling people it's okay to sin. What about your church? All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm that pastor that, that, that fires back sometimes. So here's the scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 10. Saul, who is now Paul, says, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. King James Version, my grace is sufficient for thee. My power works best in weakness, so now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, the hardships, the persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, Then I am, Paul says, the Lord has done a great work in me, and he has used me mightily. But in order to keep me from becoming proud, in order to keep me humble, I was given a thorn in my flesh. Can I tell you the reason that you struggle with what you struggle with uh, is so that you can be reminded that you haven't arrived yet? Uh, see, the truth of the matter is if we didn't have any weaknesses, uh, if we didn't have any struggles, uh, we walk around here uh, with our chest stuck out uh, talking about everybody else who messes up. Uh, but God says, you know what? Uh, before you get beside yourself, here's a little bit of weakness. But then we take that as Christians and want to beat other people up because their weakness may show and the first thing we want to know is how did they become a vessel of God. It amazes me how we can spot everybody else's weakness. We can spot everybody else's shortcomings. We can spot everybody else's faults and their flaws. But somehow we live in a house that don't have any mirrors. Have you ever walked by your mirror? And then you say, whoa. <laughs> oh, that's just me? <laughs> because sometimes you can get so busy in life 
looking at everybody else and everything else that you don't check yourself. And then when you finally get around to looking at yourself, you'll see. Whoa, you ain't all that. But in spite of your flaws, God still chooses to use you. Can I tell you the reason that you struggle with what you struggle with is so that you can be reminded that you have not arrived. Uh, the reason that God created us uh, as flawed masterpieces uh, is so that we cannot look at others uh, and their flaws and judge them uh, and act as if they cannot be used of God. God can use any of us. And he chooses to do so in spite of our flaws. He sees your bad attitude. Yet he still chose you. He sees your nasty disposition. Yet he still chooses you. He sees your unfaithfulness. Yet he still chooses you. He, he sees your get over mentality. Yet he still chooses you. He, he, he chooses you. Flaws and all. He has chosen you as an imperfect instrument of God. And he chose you in spite of your present flaws. When we look at the life of Saul, it serves as proof that God can use us as imperfect instruments in spite of our past faults. Secondly, when we look at the life of Saul, it serves as proof that God can use us as imperfect instruments in spite of our present flaws. But then lastly, when we look at the life of Saul, it serves as proof that God can use us as imperfect instruments in spite of people's folly. That's a good one there. Look at verses 26 through 27. It says, when Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers. Here it is. But they were all afraid of him, and they did not believe he had truly become a believer. Then Barnabas brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. Saul has turned his life around. He is no longer persecuting Christians, but he is now preaching Christ. Saul is no longer seeking out people to, to, to threaten but he's seeking out people to testify to. Saul is no longer seeking to take people's life, but he is seeking to help change people's life. But because of who he used to be and because of what he used to do, people are skeptical of Saul. Because of his reputation, many people just do not believe that Saul is of the Christian faith. And not only is it hard for them to believe that he has been converted, but it's even harder for them to believe that he has been chosen. Oh, see, some of y'all may not relate to this yet. But some of us know what it's like when you tell your friends things I used to do, I don't do no more. Places I used to go, I don't go no more. And your friends look at you and give you that look like, mm-hmm. I remember my friends told me, we'll see you. You'll be back. Because they don't believe it when God has changed your life. And that's why you have to be careful how you walk in front of people. Because you can walk upright for 11 months after a year and 29 days. But day 30, you have a bad day. And the people who've been waiting on you to slip up, waiting on you to say that cuss word, waiting on you to lose your temper. First thing they say, after one mistake, I told you that there wasn't anything to it. They, 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 are, they don't believe that Saul has been changed. They don't believe that he has been converted. They don't see him as being chosen. And because Saul continues to preach with such power and boldness, the Bible says that on more than one occasion, they plotted to kill Saul, so he had to be sent away. Got to get ready to take my seat. And as I do, I just need to remind some of you 
that everybody don't believe that you have been changed. There are some people who will remember who you used to be. And there are some people who will remember what you used to do. And because they can't uh, get past who you used to be, and because they can't get past what you used to do, uh, they will have you to believe that God cannot use you. Uh, they will have you to believe that you are not qualified uh, to be used by God. Uh, they will try to convince you that you are disqualified uh, because of your past foolishness. Uh, but can I tell you that there is uh, such thing as foolish people being used by God? Uh, I want you to know uh, that they saying you can't be used uh, because of your foolishness. Uh, but I want to let you know that it is your foolishness uh, that God wants to use uh, because the Bible says uh, that God chooses things uh, that the world considers foolish uh, in order to shame those who think that they are wise. Uh, and he chooses things that are powerless uh, to shame those who are powerful. Uh, God chooses things despised by the world. Things counted as nothing at all. And he used them to bring to nothing what the world considered important. Look at somebody across from you and say, neighbor, I know that you've done some foolish things in your life, but God is about to use you as his imperfect instrument. I know that you may feel as though you are not qualified. I know that you may feel as though you are not wise enough. I know you may feel as though you are not spiritual enough, but God is about to use you. I know that you have your faults. I know that you have your flaws. But God specializes in using people with faults and with flaws. I want to encourage somebody this morning by reminding them that God has a plan to use you. He may have to knock you off of your feet, but he plans on using you. He may have to put you uh, on the potter's wheel, uh, but he has plans to use you. Uh, I don't know what you have been told, uh, but I want you to know this one thing. Uh, God uh, knows exactly who you are, uh, but yet God uh, has still called you. Uh, he told Jeremiah, I know the plans uh, I have for you, uh, plans to prosper you, uh, plans to bring you uh, to an expected end. Uh, can I tell tell you uh, that God knows uh, every one of your weaknesses, uh, but he still wants to use you. Uh, God knows uh, all of your shortcomings, uh, but he still wants to use you uh, because God uh, specializes uh, in using people uh, that others uh, have written off. Uh, God uh, used Noah, uh, and Noah was a drunk. Uh, God uh, used Moses, uh, and Moses had a stuttering problem. God used Abraham, and Abraham was very old. God used Jacob, and Jacob was a trickster. God used Gideon, and Gideon was afraid. God used Jeremiah, and Jeremiah was young. God used Rahab, and Rahab was a prostitute. God used Peter, and Peter was a cusser. God used Paul, and Paul persecuted Christians. So, Lord, if you can use Noah, if you can use Moses, if you can use Abraham, if you can use Jacob, if you can use Gideon, if you you can use Jeremiah, if you can use Rahab, if you can use Peter, and if you can use Paul, here I am. Use me for your service. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. So, Lord, here I am. Use me as your vessel. Use me as an imperfect instrument of God. Use me until drug dealers become deacons. Use me until whoremongers become worshipers. Use me until prisoners become praisers. Use me until sinners become saints. Use me 
until dogs become trustees. Use me until murderers become ministers. All I'm trying to tell somebody is not how you start, but how you finish. So, Lord, I'm available to you. Look at somebody across the room and say, all you have to do is be willing. All you have to do is avail yourself. I'm just trying to tell somebody that it does not matter who you are. It does not matter where you come from. It does not matter what problems you may have or what personality flaws you may exhibit. It does not matter what your education level may be. It doesn't matter what position you may or may not hold, but you need to know that God can and God will. He'll use you as his servant. How do I know? Because one day God had to blind me to some things of the world. One day God had to knock me off of my high horse. One day when I was down in a dark place, there was a light that shined round about me, a light that shined from heaven. And ever since that light shined on me, it left a light down within me. And this little light of mine, ah, ah, I'm going to let it shine all in my I'm gonna let it shine everywhere I go I'm gonna let it shine all you need to know is that for God to use you he don't need you in a pulpit he don't need you holding a microphone but every day when you walk into your office Lord here I am use me Every day when you walk into the gym, Lord, here I am, use me. Every day when you walk your neighborhood, Lord, here I am, use me. I want to let you know that the reason that God can use you is because God really don't need you. Because it's his strength and not yours. It's his words and not yours. It's his glory and not yours. So all you are is a vessel from the Lord. And the reason that he made you with all those flaws, the reason that he made you with all those cracks is so that when you show up, his glory can shine through. Look at somebody and say, I made up in my mind that I'm going to be a vessel for the Lord. Some of you have been used by the devil. Some of you have been used by your boyfriend. Some of you have been used by your girlfriend. So why not say, if anybody is going to use me, Lord, here I am. Keep on using me until you use me up. Look at somebody and say, with all that's within me, I dedicated to the work of the Lord because no man having put his hand on the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. But do I have anybody in this sanctified building that says, I, 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 I got a kingdom mindset. I, I got a made up mind. The Lord, I do what you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to. If it's on the mountaintop, send me and I'll go. If it's in the valley low, send me 
and I'll go whatever. Whatever you need from me, Lord, I'm willing to be an imperfect instrument for your glory. People will be shocked at who God chooses to use. I've heard it all. You ain't ready to pastor no church. He chose me. You've heard it all. You ain't ready to be a deacon. He chose you. Who are you to lead praise and worship? He chose me. Who are you to teach Sunday school? He chose me. When you understand that you were not chosen because you were the best, but you were chosen because you were available. I've learned not to be upset when somebody tell me I'm not the best. I'm cool with that. I just want to be available. I just want to be used of God. See, when you start using words like the best, you start comparing. And when you start comparing, someone is going to come up short. But the truth of the matter is, whether it's one, two, three, or four people that's being compared, everyone comes up short. Because all of us have shortcomings. But when we understand, Lord, use me in spite of me. That's my prayer every Sunday. Lord, don't let the people miss out because of the frailty of your preacher. Because I'm subject any day of the week to have a bad day. And you don't have to look at me like that. Because some of you are too. I've been on the other end of some of your bad days. And some of you have probably been on the other end of my bad days. But when we understand that our moment of a bad moment or our bad moment does not qualify or disqualify us as being used by God. It just means that just like Paul or Saul, whichever one you want to call them, that we have this weakness in this flesh. And as long as we're in it, we're going to have some shortcomings. It's, it's flawed. He made us this way. He gave us emotions. That don't mean we have to act on everyone, but he made us this way. So it doesn't catch him by surprise when you're chosen, but sometimes you get conflicted. Don't act like you had never been conflicted. I resigned 30 times before. I'm done. I'm out. And the Lord said, you finished with your pity party? You tripping off of them, can I show you you? And I have to get back in the spirit and say, Lord, here I am. Use me. Because the truth of the matter is, all of us are his vessels. Some of us have different platforms. Some of us have different purposes. But at the end of the day, all of us are being used by God to bring him glory. I'm done. You can stand to your feet all over the building. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. We pray that you've been inspired by today's message. We would love for you to come and worship with us in person, but if you're unable to do so, we understand. But we'll be here next Sunday again and every Sunday at 10, 15 a.m. Now, after hearing today's message and you seek salvation or you seek rededication, there's a number that is on your screen, 877-295-4888. When you call that number, someone will be able to walk you through the plan of salvation or rededication. Also, if you seek to become a member here at Bethel Baptist Church, you can call that same number 
877-295-4888. Someone will get some information from you to get some information to you so that we can also be united together as family. Again, thank you for worshiping with us. Also, remember to like, subscribe, and share our content with others. But before we go, let's have a word of prayer. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for today and on today's message. Father, we thank you and we pray that it is a seed and good soil that it will take up, root, and grow. But on this day, we ask that you go with us and stand by us until we all meet here again. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, thank you for worshiping with us today. And we pray that we see you again real soon. Have a blessed week.